This is Under Review, the show that talks about Colorado sports with a sprinkling of national sports stories as well. I'm Jordan Long. We're two weeks into the NFL season, and I know week three started last night as the Cleveland Browns beat the Pittsburgh Steelers. This got me thinking, which NFL team is the most surprising and which one is the most disappointing? This is through two weeks. Like I have said on the show, the NFL is always an overreaction league each and every week. Our franchise is praised, praised when they win and criticized when they lose. So you like to win so you can be praised. You don't like to be criticized. It's a pass or fail league. Let's start with the surprise team, the New York Giants, who have passed the last two weeks. The New York Giants came into this year with not very high expectations. They went 4-13 in 2021 last year and fired head coach Joe Judge. Of course, they hired Brian Dable to replace Joe Judge. The over-under for the amount of wins for this team this year for the New York Giants was set at 7.5 wins. That would have been better than the four wins last year. The Giants, though, haven't been, the pl- haven't been to the playoffs since 2016. I never thought they would compete for their division, the NFC East division. I know in my NFL preview, I had the Eagles winning the NFC East division and the Cowboys earning a playoff spot. This year, though, I know it's just two games, but the New York football Giants are 2-0 and tied for first place in the NFC East division. The Giants beat the Tennessee Titans in week one, a team a lot of people thought would go far in the playoffs this year, 21 to 20. Last week, they barely got past the Carolina Panthers, 19 to 16. Two games and their margin of victory is four points. They are finishing games and that's all that matters in the NFL. Even though that they have been close, it doesn't matter. Why? 2 and 0 is 2 and 0. They're one of five undefeated teams in the NFL. That is the New York Giants. Offensively, the Giants have gained an average of 329.5 yards per game, ranking 21st in the NFL. They pass for an average of 159 yards, second to last. Only the Chicago Bears are worse. Rushing-wise, they average 170.5 yards per game on the ground, fifth in the league. What has helped them on offense is the fact that Daniel Jones is not having the big turnovers or forcing the play. I know he's only passed for 364 yards, but has three touchdowns and one interception so far. So he is reading the defense. The running game is helping him out. The defense, though, is playing well, and they're giving up an average of 317 yards per game, 12th in the NFL. They also, that defense also doesn't give up big plays through the air as opponents toss for 197.5 yards per game. The run defense, that's an area that needs to be cleaned up because opponents are rushing through that defense at 119.5 rush yards per game that the defense gives up. Overall, though, the Giants are playing well, and I know it's only two games. It could all change, but they are the surprise team at 2-0. Now, as for the biggest disappointment this this year as a team so far, the Cincinnati Bengals. The Bengals, I think I even picked them to win the AFC North Division in my preview just because they are that good, or at least they at least I thought they were that good. If they didn't win their division, at least earn a wild card spot. So they didn't have to win the AFC North Division, but get into the playoffs. Coming into this year. They were coming off a Super Bowl loss to the LA Rams. I expected quarterback Joe Burrow to take another step forward. Well, Cincinnati hasn't played well, and they sit at 0-2. Could it be a Super Bowl hangover for this team? It's looking like it. The offense is playing fairly well, gaining an average of 343 yards per game, 18th in the NFL. Through the air, they passed for 232 yards per game, ranking 14th in the NFL. The Bengals, though, I'd like to see more production from their run game, and they actually run 
for 111 yards per game on the ground. Not bad, not great, but I want those totals pretty much better for the Cincinnati Bengals. There's one player who is struggling, and it's really a surprise to me, and that is quarterback Joe Burrow. It seems like he's forcing the play, but the fact of the matter is it's not all on him. That offensive line isn't giving him time to set his feet to throw the football. Burrow has tossed for 537 yards and three touchdowns, but he's been picked up four times. Unexcusable. You cannot have those turnovers. It hasn't been all his fault. His line hasn't per- hasn't protected him. That is, the offensive line hasn't protected Joe Burrow, and he's been sacked 13 times. Defensively, the Bengals are seventh in the NFL, permitting 302 yards per game. Through the air, 211 yards per game. Not bad, not great, but I like their run defense, only giving up 91 yards on the ground. Those are great stats by the defense, but the offense has to show up at some point. Still, this is a team that I thought would be better than they are. I thought they would be better than 0-2. Of course, 2-0 would be a great start. 1-1 would be all right. But they are 0-2, and and you cannot have that. They're behind the eight ball right now. I know the Cincinnati Bengals can turn their season around because there's time to do so. So after two games of the NFL season, my surprise team is the New York Giants, while my disappointing team is the Cincinnati Bengals. We're going to move on to hockey and the NHL with the Colorado Avalanche. The Colorado Avalanche, as we all know, start their title defense of the Stanley Cup on October 12th. They are, and that's actually when they will raise the championship banner and face the Chicago Blackhawks. They would like nothing better than to repeat as champions. Of course, hockey is a long season at 82 games, so anything is possible. While the Avalanche decide to keep one of their top forwards, Nathan McKinnon, to a contract extension, and I will get those numbers in a minute. Nathan McKinnon was on the final year of his deal, paying him $6.85 million. So the Avalanche really didn't have to do anything. They could have waited until the end of the year to talk to Nathan McKinnon. The risk of doing that, though, is they could have lost him to free agency. Another team might have been interested in him. The Avalanche, I think, learned from the Gabe Landeskog experience. With that, they almost waited until the 12th hour. And basically, luckily for them, Gabe Landeskog said, yes, I like the deal and stayed. Plenty of teams would have been interested in Nathan McKinnon, but the Avs kept working on a deal with him. Now, with Nathan McKinnon, he could have played on the final year of his deal. Sure, it was a gamble, but the Avalanche, though, didn't want any other team to talk to McKinnon. They agreed to a massive contract, the richest in in NHL history. So they agreed to a massive contract, the richest in the history of the NHL. Now, I thought Nathan McKinnon would take a hometown discount. I get it, though. He wanted to be paid, but I thought, hey, six or seven million dollars would be perfect. Why? So then you can get free agents. And the thing about it is McKinnon wasn't thinking that way. They agreed to an eight year deal, paying him an average of twelve point six million dollars a year. That is the highest in the game. Nathan McKinnon is one of the best players in the game. And last year he showed why, because he played 65 games for the Avs scoring 32 goals and added 56 assists for 88 points, third most points in a season in his career. In the postseason run for the Avalanche, which of course ended with him hoisting Lord Stanley, he scored 13 goals and added 11 assists. Great numbers, and the Avalanche are hoping that his numbers in the regular season go up during the time of his contract. You look at Nathan McKinnon. He's only 27 years old. Once this contract is up, he'll be 36. So he's 27 now, and once the contract is up, he'll be 36. He is starting the prime of his career. I get the reason for doing it now. In his career, he has scored 242 goals and added 406 assists for a total of 648 points. He is one of the Avalanche's best power play 
players. He has scored 71 goals on the man advantage. Five on five situations. It helps that he plays on the best line in hockey with Gabe Landeskog and Miko Rantanen. And of course, Arturi Lekkinen could be put in that first line if they have to. And that's who he played with in the playoffs. On paper, it seems like a great deal for McKinnon because he got paid. Let's face it, you want to get paid. The downside, though, it's a long deal. There could be down years for McKinnon where he doesn't put up a lot of points. Of course, there's the risk of injury in hockey. The other reason I don't like this deal, I love Nathan McKinnon, don't like the numbers, is because of the amount of money per year. That's what I don't like. Who knows how much the cap will raise, how much the salary cap will be raised, but you need money for free agents. I understand there are going to be players who are going to come and go for the avalanche in free agency as well as the trade deadline. Some will be traded out of here. The fact is you still need money for free agents. It will be interesting to see how the avalanche will do that in terms of getting free agents when his extension kicks in next year. Now we're going to stick with the Colorado Avalanche as they agreed to a one-year contract with Evan Rodriguez. The Avalanche were looking for a second-line center in free agency. Nazem Kadri was that guy for the Avalanche for the past three years. Of course, Kadri said he wanted to stay with the Avalanche. How much I believe that, I don't know. But the Avalanche didn't have enough money to keep him. And so Kadri went to the Flames for seven years worth $49 million. So Colorado knew they had to replace Nazem Kadri somehow. They agreed to a contract with Evan Rodriguez, who agreed to a team-friendly deal. What I mean by team-friendly is his contract is one year worth $2 million. Rodriguez has played seven years in the NHL with the Buffalo Sabres and the Pittsburgh Penguins. Last year, he played with Pittsburgh, scoring a career-high 19 goals and 24 assists for 43 points. Pretty good numbers overall in his NHL career. Rodriguez has played in a total of 316 games. He's collected 53 goals and 76 assists for a total of 129 points. He can score on the power play, and that is key for the Avalanche. He has scored 14 goals on the man advantage. Those numbers aren't bad, but of course the Avs want to do something special once again, and that is to go far in the playoffs. Rodriguez doesn't have much experience in the postseason, appearing in nine postseason games for Pittsburgh. He scored three goals and three assists in the playoffs for a total of six points. The Avalanche know they need a player to replace Kadri, and Rodriguez could be that guy. They do need a second line center, and that's and they actually are hoping he will do that. He just needs to keep up his scoring touch. The thing I like about it is it's only a one year deal. That means if he has a down year, Colorado can let him go into free agency. Colorado wants him to make an impact, and hopefully he does. Hopefully he will, and if he does, that just adds more scoring power to the Avalanche, especially their secondary scoring. They already know the first line is going to be great with Gabe Landeskog, Nathan McKinnon, uh, Miko Rantanen, and Arturi Lekkinen, who will jump, jump from the first to second line. Evan Rodriguez has to help the scoring touch on that second line. We're going to go to some baseball news locally here in Grand Junction, Colorado. Grand Junction, for those of you who don't know where it's located, Grand Junction is 250 miles west of Denver, and it's also 252 miles east of Salt Lake City. That gives you an idea of where the city is located. Anyway, Grand Junction has an independent baseball team called the Grand Junction Rockies. The GJ Rockies played in the league. The league that they play in is called the Pioneer League. So the Pioneer League is where the Rockies play, and that's the independent league. Of course, this independent league was the rookie affiliate teams for some of the baseball teams in Major League Baseball. The Rockies were the rookie team of the Colorado Rockies. Of course, that is not the case now since MLB changed the whole minor league system. 
MLB is not a sponsor, but a partner league of the Pioneer League. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but they partner with this league. Anyway, the GJ Rockies finished the regular season at 62 wins and 33 losses. Two teams from the North Division and South Division in the Pioneer League earn a playoff spot. How it happens is the team that wins the first half in both divisions earn a playoff spot. The winner of the second half gets the next spot in both divisions. If the team who won the first half is still in first place in the first in the second half, I should say, they obviously go to the playoffs, but then they go to the second place team. The Rockies won the second half. They faced the Ogden Raptors in the first playoff series, and all of them are best of three. So it is a series. In game one, the Rockies won 13 to five. One win, and that would take him to the Pioneer League Championship Series. They didn't get the job done, dropping game two as Ogden won 10 to six. Ogden forced a winner's take all game three. The Rockies trailed this game four to one after four innings. They ended up scoring seven unanswered runs to take an eight to four lead. Ogden scored one more time, but that was it as they won the series with an eight to five victory. It was on to the Pioneer League Pioneer League Championship Series where they faced the Missoula Panhandles. Game one was looking great for the Rockies up 12 to five going into the ninth. Missoula scored five times in the ninth, but it wasn't enough as the GJ Rockies won this game 12 to 10. And that was, they were up one nothing in the championship series. All they needed was to win one more game and they would be Pioneer League champions. Of course, Missoula could win and force a winner's game all game three. In game two, though, the Rockies swept them, rolling to a 10 to 4 victory. Congratulations to the GJ Rockies on one great season. Nothing better than to end on a high note as champions. That is the goal for any baseball team in any league. They will look to repeat next year. For now, though, the players and the Grand Judge and Rockies organization can enjoy this win. So you look at it in the Grand Judge and Rockies organization and the players can enjoy this win. Again, the Grand Judge and Rockies are your 2022 Pioneer League champions. We will finish off with my NFL picks of the week. Every week, I'm going to pick the five best matchups. So that is the five best matchups in the NFL and tell you who I think will win those games. Last week wasn't bad as I was four and one, and overall I am seven and three. That's a lot better than my regular NFL picks, which I will not tell you because I pick every single game on ESPN, but I'm not going to tell you those picks. So we will start with the Cowboys versus the Giants. The Giants are a one point favorite, basically a pick 'em game. You got to like a divisional rivalry. Both of these franchises don't like each other. The question for me is, though, can the New York Giants keep it going? Like I said, they are my surprise team at 2-0. For quarterback Daniel Jones, is can he keep playing mistake-free football? I mean, only one interception for him so far this year. The thing about this Dallas defense, though, he needs to keep finding Sterling Shepard and Kenny Galladay. Plus, run the football with Barkley. If you do that, you should be able to win. If you are the Dallas defense, what do you do? Stop the run first. That will force Daniel Jones to throw the football. This may not, and you have to blitz him. If you blitz him, this may not give Daniel Jones time to throw the football. For Dallas, Cooper Rush, their, court, their quarterback, needs time to throw the football. Plus, that offensive line must block to open up the running game for Ezekiel Elliott. In the end, though, somehow the New York Giants keep it going as they go to 3 0. The LA Rams versus the Arizona Cardinals. The Rams are a three and a half point favorite. Both of these teams come in with an identical one and one record. For the Cardinals, though, Kyler Murray does so much for that offense. What I mean by that is he can run and use his legs as well as pass it. The Rams have to find a way to stop the legs of Kyler Murray, and the passing game for Kyler Murray. That defense of the Rams has the ability to do so. For the Rams offense, 
Quarterback Matthew Stafford knows how to gain yards. Be smart with the football. In the end, though, it really comes down to third downs. Whichever offense can stay on the field and convert more third downs wins this football game. That will be the Rams. The Packers versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I should say the Green Bay Packers versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. This is the game of the week in my mind, even though that Tampa Bay is a one-point favorite over Green Bay. Both of these teams remind me of each other. Here is why. They both have Hall of Fame quarterbacks who will use all their receivers. Tom Brady for Tampa Bay and Aaron Rodgers for Green Bay. I think it comes down to which defense can keep the offense out of the end zone. I trust Tampa Bay's defense over Green Bay's defense, and Tampa Bay earns the win. The Baltimore Ravens versus the New England Patriots. The Ravens are two and a half point favorites. The thing that makes the Patriots so hard to play against is their head coach, Bill Belichick, because he always has a great game plan and always has the Patriots ready to play. I know quarterback Mac Jones, the Patriots uh, quarterback, can throw the football, which will be key. The thing about the Ravens, and it makes them difficult to play against, is their quarterback, Lamar Jackson. Jackson, Jackson can throw and run the football. The Patriots have to have a spy on him so he can't run the football. If not, it's going to be a long game. In the end, I will have to go with the Baltimore Ravens. My final game is the Buffalo Bills versus the Miami Dolphins. The Dolphins are a six, or I should say the Bills are a six-point favorite, which means the, the uh, Miami Dolphins are a six-point under, underdog. So if you look at it, the Bills are a six-point favorite. The Dolphins are a six-point underdog. The Bills offense can score and go down the field. They have the quarterback to do so, and Josh Allen who reads the defense as well to find his open receivers. The Dolphins have to figure out a way to stop that for the Bills' defense, and we saw it last week. The fact of the matter is that you have to stop the passing game of the Dolphins. The Ravens were unsuccessful stopping Tua Tagovailoa in the passing game, so you have to stop his passes. If you do that, if you can stop Tua Tagovailoa from passing, you win the football game. The Bills' defense has to put some pressure on Tua, cause turnovers. In the end, the Bills roll to a win. So my picks again, Dallas Cowboys versus the New York Giants, the New York Football Giants, the LA Rams versus the Arizona Cardinals, the LA Rams, the Green Bay Packers versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Tampa Bay, the Baltimore Ravens versus the the New England Patriots, I have to go with the Baltimore Ravens and Lamar Jackson. The Buffalo Bills versus the Miami Dolphins, I have to go with Buffalo because they are looking like a Super Bowl threat. I'm Jordan Long. This has been Under Review. Read my blog that I write Mondays through Thursdays with podcasts on Fridays at sports-scoop.com. Also, check all the shows we have on the Sideline Sports Network and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any of our great shows. They are very educational and informative about sports. We have shows every single day. This has been a Sideline Sports production.